Ronin. What is a Ronin? I imagine you are all saying or thinking the exact same thing. A Ronin is a masterless samurai, which is entirely correct. In our modern day and age, the term Ronin has become nearly as popular as other famous Japanese terms such as samurai or ninja. Indeed, in recent years we've seen an explosion in the usage of the term, from manga and anime, to superheroes, to of course, big budget Hollywood films. Hell, Ronin have even made their way into Star Wars. We all know what Ronin are, and we all know they occupy a very specific and significant place at the very bottom of pre-modern Japan's warrior class. In fact, knowledge of the term is so widespread and already understood that many books barely even have a section devoted to the topic. They just expect we already know. But when we peel back the layers, we may come to discover that the role of the Ronin is actually a much more complex one than we might have always been led to believe. Now, this idea of lower samurai is actually one which is being covered in a wider continuing series of collaborations between my channel, Samurai and Ninja History, and Sengoku Studies. As this month, as I mentioned, we are examining lower forms of samurai roles that existed throughout pre-modern Japan. I encourage you to go check out their great videos, which I will leave links to down below. But in terms of the Ronin, if you were a member of the samurai class, being a Ronin was to have hit rock bottom. Or was it? You see, the term Ronin is actually a very, very unique one. It is one that is complex and carries with it a wide range of implications. Implications that not only existed around the times when the term was used, but also ones that have since arisen over the years and in retrospect. This way in which they are viewed can not only be seen through different lenses at different times throughout history, but also today as they have become a widely romanticized aspect of Japanese history. There is a lot we are going to get into and a lot we are going to try to conceptualize. I apologize if this gets confusing. I also want to point out that, for some of you, what I'm about to cover in this video may be nothing new for you to hear. But for others, this may change how you view Ronin going forward. But the first thing we should obviously do is find the actual translation of the word. What does Ronin mean? Well, there is a couple of different ways Ronin can be written using kanji. But the most popular one goes contrary to what you might expect. The term does not outright translate to mean masterless samurai. Rather, it roughly means wandering or floating men. Someone who is just merely drifting, perhaps aimlessly. What is interesting is that the term itself may not necessarily have to apply to just samurai, and could actually apply to anyone who has lost their way. Yet over the years, the term became very intertwined with the idea of a samurai who was no longer employed. A samurai without a master, and thus without a salary, turning to a life as a vagabond. And before we apply our modern romanticization to this idea, it is important to recognize how awful this concept might have been. Specifically, if you were a samurai of the peaceful Edo period, who lost your position and was thrust out into the world, it would have been a rough situation. You were essentially a member of the warrior class, living now in a world without war. In some extreme cases, this meant perhaps even being comparable to becoming broke and homeless today. To grasp the sheer depth of the potential suffering that becoming a Ronin could inflict upon not only a samurai, but also his family, you need only look at the story told in the film Harakiri, which beautifully puts on display the real pain of the situation many samurai found themselves in upon becoming a Ronin. But that is just one side of it. That is also just one time frame. Being a Ronin could have taken many different paths depending on a wide variety of circumstances. Imagine, if you will, becoming a Ronin during the Warring Age of the Sengoku period. Say the clan you served was recently destroyed and now you found yourself without a lord to serve. However, during the Sengoku Jidai, the need for warriors was extremely high, and thus you could likely find more work relatively easily. In fact, there are plenty of famous samurai who went through this very situation. For example, figures such as Akechi Mitsuhide, Toro Takatora, and Okabe Motonobu. They all went through this experience, losing their lord, but then quickly finding another. You can see how being a ronin during a time of war was much more ideal for a samurai's career outlook. 
Indeed, one might even liken the idea of a ronin during a time of war as being somewhat similar to that of a mercenary, yet the two concepts are still quite different. There is more to this, and I do plan to get into it in a little bit, but before we do that, there is another element to this whole situation that also contributes to the identity of Ronin being so complex. Now, let's return to our base idea of a Ronin as a masterless samurai. Being a masterless member of the samurai class might usually be viewed as perhaps being negative, as we've been programmed to usually assume that being masterless means one's lord was likely dead. Yet, as you may already know, this was not always the case. In fact, many samurai throughout history knowingly chose to become ronin. This being caused by disagreement or dissatisfaction with one's lord. Thus a samurai might consciously make the decision to leave the service of a lord they no longer care to serve. And in an ideal situation would likely leave to join another clan who maybe had already extended an open invitation. This was not something treated as dishonorable except from maybe the clan that the samurai was deserting. We have to remember that loyalty, although virtuous, had to be maintained. I made a whole video about samurai loyalty, by the way. The idea that there was some honorable code like Bushido that all samurai followed has been proven to be largely a myth and modern day concept. Rather, if a samurai did not want to serve a certain lord anymore for one reason or another, they might just straight up choose to leave and accept their fate as a ronin. Now, like I said, the ideal time for this to have happened would have been during times of war, when they could have easily found another position within an opposing clan, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen during times of peace either. Many samurai were very firm in their convictions, no matter where their beliefs might take them. Take for example the famous story of the 47 Ronin. They became masterless through no fault of their own. Yet they still took it upon themselves to seek revenge, and through this, knowingly committed an action that they were all very well aware would result in their later deaths. Now, this gets us into an interesting debate regarding were they really being loyal or disloyal? Loyal to their past lord who had been put to death, or disloyal to the state for their rebellious actions? This debate is actually still ongoing to this day and the shogun at the time was probably faced with this same dilemma, yet I think he chose the best course of action that he perhaps could have, ordering all the ronin to be put to death, but also allowing them to die honorably through seppuku. You can see how he treaded a fine line. And this moves on to my next point. Ronin, although the lowest members of the samurai class, were still extremely influential. In fact, I'd argue that they might have been even more significant than many employed samurai. What do I mean by this? Well, ronin sort of became a wild card in pre-modern Japan. They existed in a way outside of the typical role of the samurai, and unfortunately, many of them were often disgruntled. Here you have a large portion of the warrior class, many of whom perhaps wandering the countryside, many of whom perhaps turning to banditry or inciting insurrection to various levels. And what gets worse is, of course, that this number only rose as Japan's Warring States era drew to a close by the coming of the 1600s. Following the Battle of Sekigahara and the birth of the Tokugawa Shogunate, many clans were being wiped completely off the map, which led to an influx of even more angry ronin. This becomes one of the largest contributing factors as to how Toyotomi Hideyori was able to amass such a threatening army by 1614, as so many ronin who had either been loyal to the previous Toyotomi regime or were hostile towards the Tokugawa were eager to join up in opposition to the shogunate. We are not talking about several hundred ronin, we are talking about tens of thousands. Some estimates even put the number of ronin who fought at Osaka as high as 100,000, which may have been around one-fourth of the entire population of all ronin in Japan at that time. Of course, a large number of ronin would have also joined up to support the Tokugawa and would later be rewarded, but all in all, the majority appear to have sided with the Toyotomi. And although the Tokugawa shogunate would of course win at the Siege of Osaka and defeat this largely ronin army, this would not be the last time they would face such a significant ronin threat. We need only look at the Shimabara Rebellion, a Christian revolt in Kyushu that occurred in the late 1630s, where ronin once again played a large hostile role. Ronin continued to pose a threat to upend the established order of the otherwise peaceful Edo period, and this scared the shogunate. 
So much so that the Tokugawa shogunate began to adopt policies aimed at restricting ronin, which had the effect of pushing many of them further into poverty or into adopting new ways to sustain themselves. Some ronin decided to give up their life as a warrior and mesh in with the lower classes, turning to life as farmers, craftsmen, and merchants. Some more successful ronin were able to transition into significant writers or heads of different martial arts schools. Others even became educators. On the more unfortunate side, some may have done whatever they could to scrape together a living, which means perhaps even becoming involved in some illegal activity. This is where some may have even come to join elements of the Yakuza, which arose during the Edo period. But it should be noted that the role of any ronin in the Yakuza is a blurry situation, and that it is important to remember that the Yakuza arose out of separate groups and are not directly connected to the samurai at all. So while it is safe to say that most ronin during the Edo period would have likely faced a difficult life, that wasn't necessarily true for all ronin, as there were those who were able to more effectively adapt. There are also two other interesting situations that arise, where the term ronin might come to mind, but may not be the most accurate to use. These could have occurred really at any point throughout Japanese history. The first was when a samurai gave up his warrior status to take on the life of a monk. In this scenario, they should really not be considered a ronin, despite leaving whatever master they may have had. This is because to become a monk, a samurai would have had to have given up their role in the regular world. The other situation is when a samurai might find himself sent into exile. This happened frequently to significant samurai in pre-modern Japan, and it raises the question of should they now be considered ronin? And there are sort of two answers to this. First off, if a samurai was just merely banished, they might still be able to seek employment elsewhere. In this case, it might be safe to consider them a ronin. But for samurai who were forced into exile, at that point these individuals would not be considered ronin because they are actively disallowed from being able to return to any normal samurai lifestyle. Now, moving ahead into the Bakumatsu era, towards the end of the Edo period, we enter into another interesting time for the ronin as many became increasingly involved in political affairs, either for or against the shogunate. This would go on as many ronin and the groups they may have been a part of would come to play a significant role during the Boshin War. Following this, of course, with the emperor restored, and by the coming of the 1870s, the samurai class would be phased out of existence, and thus, the age of the ronin came to an end as well. Of course, it would not be long until ideas of samurai and ronin became popular again. By 1954, we see the first time ronin were likely seen across the world in Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. This trend continued with more classic samurai films depicting ronin. Films like Yojimbo, The Samurai Trilogy, Harakiri, Lone Wolf and Cub, and so many more. The stoic image of the wandering samurai became fascinating. One large reason for this might be that it was a very comparable concept to that of American Westerns, where wandering gunslingers took on a very similar form. This led to the blossoming of the term we have today, as seen through more movies, but also like I mentioned at the start, manga, anime, superhero comics, and more. And of course, this all leads to our modern conception of what ronin were being very skewed. This is the real point of what I'm trying to get across in this video, that, while we tend to have a very specific image of what comes to our minds when we think of ronin today, this wandering noble samurai, who likely has an idealistic set of virtues and is unparalleled in combat, would have likely been a very rare occurrence in pre-modern Japan. Instead, ronin could have taken on a wide variety of forms that likely was further dependent on the age in which they lived, and that, despite occupying the lowest position within the samurai warrior class, they still ended up playing a very prominent role throughout Japanese history. If you want to learn more about Lower Samurai, don't forget to check out the other videos made by Samurai and Ninja History and Sengoku Studies. Links to both of their videos can be found in the description. So, with that said, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.